time to do an at-home episode. No, not because of fire. More so water. Though I do blame my faith-based reviews on God causing some studio damage. The Burning is a 1981 slasher film known for actually being pretty good. And also it has a big list of before they were famous actors. From Jason Alexander to Holly Hunter to Fisher Stevens, it has everyone in it. Hell, I'm pretty sure I'm in the movie. This was a very intense pull, as it actually was a race this time, which the movie about a race, Safari 3000, lost and went off with its true match, the romance something short of paradise. They have a lot in common. They had the same amount of votes. Revenge of the Ninja was winning for a bit, as evidenced by the strategy of I voted for Revenge of the Ninja out of obligation that it has the most votes. Oh, you see what you did there? You cursed the ninja! Don't ever count out Cropsy. He'll be lurking behind you to knock the other choices off the raft. What seems like it would be another post-Friday the 13th knockoff actually isn't, as the idea for the film, under the title of The Cropsy Maniac, came about in the late 70s. The script was inspired by Cropsy, an urban legend out of Staten Island, who is a boogeyman-like figure who snatches kids off the streets or in their rooms, and it turned out this was all attributed to a real-life serial killer named Andre Rand. Here, Cropsey is a caretaker at a summer camp who is burnt in a prank, so now he's gonna get those damn kids! It was a popular enough concept at the time that the slasher film Madman also wanted Cropsey as the villain, but had to completely change course once finding out about the production of The Burning. There were plenty of names behind the scenes, too. Director Tony Malum would direct a lot of documentaries, plus the Rudger Hauer sci-fi flick Split Second. Jack Shoulder, director of Elm Street 2 and The Hidden, edited it. And Tom Savini passed up work on Friday the 13th Part 2 to do effects on it. I'm sure there's other notable names attached, too. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that happened. Just say it's also in the universe of the Weinstein-directed films, too, like Playing for Keeps and The Gnome's Great Adventure. It turns out Weinstein was Cropsy this whole time. Let's see, what are we getting? Camp Blood, Camp Placid Pines, Camp Arawak, ah, Camp Blackfoot. Guess we can film there. After years of torment with the bastard caretaker Cropsy, the campers are eager to get their revenge. Jamie, you with us? Right. Ugh, last night we put honey and ants in the lunch lady's hair because the hot dogs were dry. When will it end? They've had to endure so much pain, as you can see. These teens have been going here for about 30 years. It's all for one and one for all, even Richie Tozier is in. Which he will work into his stand-up routine decades later. Whoa, 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 guys, are, are we 1981 looking enough? Uh, we are? Okay, let's keep moving. Now remember, guys, when you hear him scream, NOT THE BEES! It means he has opened the box and we can continue with the sacrifice. On the plus side, we're finding out what exactly it was that killed Beetlejuice. This is a prequel I didn't know existed. The kids will have to wake him up, though. They kind of forgot their wallet and keys when setting up the prank. And in case you're wondering what was in the box... Ah! Oh, you know, they found that on one of the trails, the one that leads to Pancot Palace. I'm sure he'll laugh this off. <laughs> Well, you can't get mad at the title. Weird to say about a scene that started with a wormy skull with candles in it, but this escalated quickly. One week later, he sits in the hospital with a bowl of jello and a thirst for vengeance. They use Cropsy to break in the new doctors. Hey, listen, you got a minute? No, I, I, I want to show you something I... down the hall. After you see this guy, you will never want to come back in here again. Do you mind? It's my first day on the job at 50 years old. They often dare each other to look at Cropsy the same way the kids would dare each other to look at a dead body. Get me my candle skull! Next, they'll cover him in butter and make him smell like lobster. I mean, that could be what happens. Who knows if the orderly is going to be okay? He's never mentioned again. Also serving as a producer and co-writer was Brad Gray, former chairman and CEO of Paramount, 
and a producer on The Sopranos and The Departed. While Corky Burger sounds like that'd be the name of one of the campers in a movie like this. Let's just move along and nothing to see here. Let's go look at the burnt corpse of Cropsey again, a little more appealing than Meatloaf Harvey. It's five years later, enough time for Cropsey's badass scars to set in. It's been a long struggle, but now that you've regained your strength, it's time for you to leave. Cons yeah, we're sorry. It's just not as fun to dare each other to look at you anymore, especially when the pig man checked in last week. He goes immediately to the red light district. He's ready to be out of the hospital. If it looks like he's gonna bump into the exterminator, here close, Cropsey actor Lou David was one of the guys on the street bothering Robert Ginty. Though it's nice of him to write some suggestions for the cinema snob. Finally, we have a slasher killer who gets out of the hospital and his first priority is to get so laid. That's because he convinces her he's the Shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hotel rooms of these working girls. Cropsy knows because he pays for it. However, he's a little more Fred Krueger than she intended. Burns, huh? Well, that'll cost you an extra 20. Even getting stabbed with scissors escalates quickly. No! It needed to start storming so it could wash the blood off of her expensive blouse. But back at Camp Black, uh, I mean Camp Stonewater, go back to Camp Crystal Lake. No one likes the name Forest Green. Here they have a nice game of slow motion boobs bouncing. Don't take your eyes off the prize. And no, I'm not talking about the softball. Hey, nothing soft about this game, boys. <laughs> Look at that ass. This whole movie is a collection of people who bothered Robert Ginty and the Exterminator. That's Ned Eisenberg. He was one of the gang members. And the other guy, I think he was in a McDLT commercial. This is not why we put you on second base so you could talk about ass for five minutes or this. Oh, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, throw the ball. Throw it, throw it. God damn it, teenage Harvey. I'm getting out of here. They're starting to use their erections as bats. You know the killer is nearby because they literally did smear Vaseline on the lens. Thankfully, though, it's not like last week when the trees came to life and the evil dead because they have Cropsy here to chop down these horny branches before they get out of control. Karen does like Eddie and all, but... I really like Eddie. Sometimes he really scares me. It's got so I told the supervisor I didn't want to go on the overnight. He's really sweet. It's just that, well, I don't want to be alone with him. But other than that... Time to slowly rise and shine and wake up to go outside for your first cigarette of the day. Plus, with the girl's shower being outside, it's gonna make it easier to sit in the trees with binoculars. Come on, guys, this is gonna be great! Could it be Cropsy lurking around the corner with pervy shears? What's going on? No, it's just lovesick Brian Backer again. You get back here and explain yourself. You are really sick. Wait a minute, what's going on? Alfred's been prowling around the girl's shower. Oh yeah, I'm sure he's the only one. You son of a bitch, Alfred, I told you, pitching an ass and leering is reserved for the softball field. The Burning is one of the best slashers of its time, but there are parts where it is impossible not to think about who co-wrote it. That kid's weird, Todd. What the hell was he doing snooping around here? Just a kid. Kids do that. Did you do that? Is this just Weinstein writing about his own summer camp experiences? Who knew a Weinstein biopic would have dead hookers? He is in big trouble. You bought $40 binoculars to sit in the trees and watch girls, and you don't even have a ladder, rat. I joke, but the girls really are sitting around smoking. Yes, Allie, just think. Three nights alone with Alfred. <laughs> Why does anyone have to be alone with anyone here? Let's take a break so Alfred can watch one of them take a shit. I know the perfect way to get fruity tricks. Better hop to it. Something's up. Silly rabbit, tricks are for kids. Animal haters. <laughs> 
we're back and hello, I'll be the Michael DeLuise of the camp. He is warning him to stay away from his best girl. Actually, that's Larry Joshua playing Glazer. And when Alfred gets his superpowers, they'll meet back up later so he can screw him over once more. Some of these teen actors actually are older than the counselors. And yeah, it's pretty normal in these movies for the actors to look older than the characters they're playing. And usually it doesn't distract me that much. But here, this is a case where sometimes it's hard to figure out if one is a camper or or a counselor. One thing is for sure, this is officially the summer of George. Alfred, on the other hand. <laughs> he is clearly the Shelly of the camp. Because there are a lot of actors here that would go on to more prominent roles, it is a slasher where the acting is quite good, and the characters, like Jason Alexander, pretty charismatic, even if they're doing something like this. Hi, Sally. Hi, pretty girl. Hey, Sal, you wanna go for a swim with me? Can we get a sniper in here to protect these girls? All right, guys, I got him in my range. Thank you, Fisher Stevens. It was for the best that the campers had guns. Oh! Ah! Shit, what the hell was that? Wait for the big finish. Oh, you think that's funny, huh? Must everyone be set on fire at camp? And the best part of all of them being adults, a night of gambling and smoking cigars. Like it's a camp run by the Foot Clan from the 1990 Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, and they also deal in condoms like it's pot. Five bucks. I'll pay. Give me what I asked for. I'll... Yes, yes, the cucumbers are in there too. Uh-oh, is someone peeking through the window? I saw it, it was there. Well, there sure as hell ain't nothing out there now. Now you know what it's like. The girls hired a killer to peep in on them to teach them a lesson. Sometimes with these two, it looks like someone made a sitcom version of My Bodyguard where Adam Baldwin and Chris Makepeace go to camp. Or hell, if Baldwin joined him in Meatballs. It's dinner time. Hurry up, girls. Eat quick. What is this, prison? One second it's smooching, the next a fight, and then a stare down. He's been staring at me. That's the harm he's doing. Maybe he wants your body blade. Fellas, fellas, you're all gonna end up on a sex offender's list. I like the guy who's trying to address the crowd, though. Some of you older ones are leaving tomorrow for a three-day canoe trip to Devil's Creek. Please, use your normal speaking voice. That'll make sure they hear you over the crowd. I've seen this movie many times. I know Fisher Stevens is going to be fine in this scene because what does happen to some of these characters is one of the best payoffs in any 80s slasher. Oh, what's his character's name again? Woodstock. Okay, why do they always have names like this? Let's get you back to the mess hall so you can hang out with T-Bone and Eight Ball. Sleep tight. The music cue means canoe trip tomorrow. <laughs> Move along fast, someone's waiting to make y'all squeal. Maybe we should split up so we don't get knocked over by insults. Hey, I told you not to beat your schlong last night, it drains your power. Oh yeah, well, the jerk store called. Oh wait, I can't use that. Folks, it's a big lake. We're not gonna get anywhere if we're this close. Even the boats are trying to pinch each other's asses. And it's running a little late, but the obligatory campfire exposition scene is here. It was called Camp Blackfoot. No one goes there anymore. Everything burnt down. It's now a Hardee's. We'll go there in the morning. The sausage biscuit with cheese and a side of hash rounds will really hit the spot. All right, Todd, can we hurry this up? Last night it was the story of Jason. The previous night it was Madman Mars. Then Scuzzlebutt for some reason. None of your killers show up here. The only Jason here is in his finest cardigan, so he can offer some espresso before he starts his poetry reading. And I think Holly Hunter has less lines in this than in the piano. Back in the 80s, we were way better at our ghost stories. The camps let us use giant sharp objects to get the terror across. <laughs> Psych! It's been the killer from curtains this whole time! They all have fun, even if they got plenty of shit in their pants. Even the moon was scared away, hence why they had to finish the rest of the night using the sun as a double. I sure hope these two lovebirds end up together. You're always talking about how many women you've had. I don't want to be just another statistic. 
Karen. Knock it off, will you? It was right of Goodfellas to cut out the Henry and Karen camping scene. Anyway, here's my dick! How is it the killer seems like the less dangerous one at camp? This is like watching an Unsolved Mysteries reenactment where they're like, she's been missing for 41 years. Here's one of the possibilities. Someone at the camp has to be a creepy assaulter. That way we can cheer when he dies. Whoa, whoa, wait. No, damn it, not the girl. She's had a tough enough night. Harvey, we keep trying to tell you Eddie's not the hero of this story. But it's hard to get mad. It's a dinky, dinky, doo -da morning. Dinky, dinky, doo -da morning. Because the jaunty music makes every morning great, even if one of them is missing. Wake up. Where's Karen? All right, Eddie, on your feet. Come clean. Did you murder one of the girls again or not? Yeah, yeah, wait, again? I also like the good cop, bad cop routine. Are you sure you didn't go just a little too far? Hey, shh, take it easy, huh? I mean, hey, come on, Michelle. Boys will be boys. This scene can only get better from here. You know, Karen told me she was really scared of you. Oh, yeah, she was scared of me, huh? Hey, go easy on him. He produced several great films for Miramax, Michelle. Even the canoes are now gone. Dark situation. That's why Michelle actress Leah Ayers played alternate universe Marsha Brady. It was on that 90s dramedy version. I see water. We're getting close to the famous raft scene. They even blame Alfred for stealing the canoes, which in fairness, if Cropsey wasn't here, it would be very easy to make Alfred the killer. His story is almost Jason Voorhees and Angela's experiences at camp. I love that their plan is they have to build a raft to get back to camp, as if they're trapped on an island. Guys, the water is only a foot deep. Just walk through it or along the shore. Even the characters in Cannibal Holocaust didn't have to build their own raft. Though stuff like this would happen. Just coal your engines. Glazer, no! Really, I think they're building a raft just so the girls can sit on it because none of the rapey campers can swim. She's saying no, but really, it's a Harvey yes. Listen, you can trust me, you hear? It's gonna be real good. Oh my god. It's like watching the drugged barbecue sauce scene from The Cosby Show again. I mean, I guess I'll root for Alfred. I don't know. If this were another Stephen King miniseries, he'd be Harold in the stand. Now be safe, you guys. Let them know where we are. Remember, we're by the big tree. I sense raft shenanigans coming. There will be an evil oil slick underneath it that devours them whole and melts their skin. Oh, wait, sorry. Got Stephen King on the mind again. This is not helping Eddie's unsolved mysteries case. How come Karen left her really? It's like Michelle said, okay? She was upset about something, all right? Eh, <laughs> good enough answer for me. Let's just hope he said a prayer before he buried her. Eddie doesn't have too much longer, and for Eddie to die, so does everyone else here, in one of the best kills in an 80s slasher. The good news is, they do make it to the canoe. <laughs> the bad news, they'll never find out where Eddie buried Karen's body. It's a scene where you can feel Savini and the director's delight in making it. So much so, the director is standing in for Cropsey here. Just like Savini would stand in for him sometimes in the fire scene. And yes, it is this scene that caused it to end up on the video nasties list. It's not a long or drawn out scene, but it's an hour in and goes from zero to mass murder quick. Oh, and I guess these two are a thing. Michelle, please, give Eddie's corpse a break. He just died. He earned the right to pinch some angels' asses at the pearly gates. Trust me, that would be hotter than this scene. That's all. I'm sorry, Sally. I, I don't know what it's happened. It's okay. God, you know if the killer just stuck to killing off the creeps here, Cropsey would actually be the hero of the movie. Too bad he also kills the characters who are already having an awful enough time at camp. But now is my chance to be the hero. The guys will love me when they find out how long I was able to jerk off in the bushes without finishing. Hell, in scenes like this, when Glazer finds Sally's dead body, I wouldn't have been surprised if he just had sex with the body anyway. Even getting killed himself means that Sally would only have a few minutes peace in the afterlife. Oh no, Todd, you gotta wake up! We overslept! You may think it's night, but look, it's actually daylight out! When we come back, it'll be time to make breakfast. There are camps, and there are camps. 
But for boys 7 to 16, one camp does it all. Mihaha. It means laughing blue water. There's plenty of that. We're back, and Alfred, it's okay. The killer's just misunderstood. No need to get him in trouble or send him home. Run back, Alfred. Tell Michelle not to worry about it. Oh, man, that stings. Tell the kids not to worry about the raft of dead teens. Be careful around that water now. Hey, Dave, what do you really think's happening? I don't know. Am I swimming out there? I mean, it looks cold. This is the last place I want significant shrinkage. They have to pretend to mourn Eddie. As well as the others, I guess. They are sleeping with the fishers. We could go looking for Alfred, too, but hey, Glazer's gone, Eddie's gone. Why screw up a good thing? Let's let Alfred peep in on some humping bears. While the others are doing the camping tradition called Race for Your Fucking Life, Charlie Brown. Only weirdo Jeff can help us now. What's with the raft? Where are my canoes? Jeff, where's the outboard? What do you want with the outboard? Okay, now he's 80 yard? What's with this guy's voice? The movie does have a lot you could joke about, especially considering the Weinstein attachment, but a lot of things really do make this work, even outside of the Savini effects, which are great. Some of the more dated scenes do add some entertainment value, but in terms of the filmmaking, it's got solid build-up and suspense, and the cinematography is quite good, as it's shot by Harvey Harrison. The better Harvey of the film! He also did second unit work on GoldenEye and V for Vendetta. The music elevates it too, as it's got a very good theme from Rick Wakeman of Yes. Because of all that, it's a slasher that did get some better reviews than others, especially over the years and after achieving cult status. It did have good early test screenings, and even in some theaters during a limited release, it did well, but when expanding to more theaters across the country, it underperformed severely, most likely due to heavy competition from Friday the 13th Part 2, Happy Birthday to Me, and a ton of other slashers of the year that unfortunately this got buried under. However, I'd say it stood the test of time and is more memorable than some others that did do better box office back then. No offense to hits like Graduation Day, but I see the burning get brought up a lot more in terms of the best slashers of the era. Having an urban legend character like Cropsy be the villain, too, is an added bonus. It does all link together, with Todd being one of the ones who helped set him on fire at the beginning, which makes Cropsy still look like an ass. Why kill everyone else? Er, well, everyone who didn't have it coming. Actually, wait, that does make sense if you think of Cropsy as the exterminator. Savini did say he was disappointed in the burn makeup since he only had a few weeks to do it, but I kind of like it. Just say it's what the actor really looks like. It is his IMDb profile picture. I love it when that happens. Good job, rat. Now Mike Damone knows what it's like to be stabbed in the back. And Jason Alexander made it out alive, too. Just like in the Seinfeld episode, The Burning. He leaves happily, always leaving them wanting more. We aren't the only ones who want more. Oh, shit. You think a legend like Cropsy will go out that easily? What? No, don't set him on fire. That's how you got into this mess to begin with. Hell, it almost does drift into its own Friday the 13th Part 2, as now we see another campfire scene of talking about the events we just saw. It doesn't quite set up for a sequel, though. Don't move. You're dead! But that guy is definitely gonna be the new gropey one of the camp. This is an enjoyable movie. If you like the genre, I'm sure you've already seen it. And while a lot can be watched for the irony, it delivers in the kills and in the sleaze. I wish there was a sequel, which there is a 2009 Cropsy documentary, and you could watch the movie on a double bill with Madman. Now comes the hard part, getting all the rafts out of the studio. The garden shears can stay. I gotta trim my face somehow. Nothing I can get you? Life jacket? Spermicide? Oh, 